This morning it's good to see you if you're a visitor here today we just want to tell you welcome give our visitors a hand refuge city church amen come on give them a good hand god bless you god bless you thank you for being here there's a little uh there's a little uh little hello thing that we'd like you to fill out and turn in on the information booth on the way out and we have a really cool gift for you pastor jimmy was showing them out 
this week, and man, they're pretty awesome. Did you come to worship the Lord? Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, let's praise Jesus.
you across this room to begin to give God praise for being the God of all hope, for being the God of your deliverance, for being the God of freedom and salvation when you didn't deserve it. Aren't you glad today? Somebody that can relate with that. You have given me freedom. You have given me joy. You have taken my burden. Come on, think about those words as you sing and we sing. You have given me freedom. You have given me joy. You have taken my burden. You have given me freedom. You life-giving flow. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the refreshing of your hope. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. Thank you. Thank you for your saving grace for me. Saving grace for this room, for every person that's in this place. We didn't deserve it. We certainly couldn't earn it. But we receive it, we drink deep from the well, the well of your Holy Spirit, the well of your salvation, the well of your victory and your freedom. We give you all the glory, Lord.
so sweet today. We pour out our love to you, Jesus. At the name of Jesus, everything changes. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, mountains move. And I want us, I want us in unison this morning. I want us to invite not just the name of Jesus, but I want the presence of Jesus here this morning. How many need the presence of Jesus on your life this morning? And I want you to do this. I just want you to put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. If you don't know him, don't be creepy, but we're just gonna we're just gonna believe we're just gonna just for a few moments and I want you out loud I want you to begin to take authority in this room that at the name of Jesus every circumstance in your life every circumstance you're going through every trial every addiction will be free this morning father we proclaim where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom today and in the name of Jesus everyone say that in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and at the presence of Jesus demons flee Demons flee, demons flee. Father, we proclaim right now, we proclaim right now, you are the God of the heavens and the earth. And we ask right now for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in this place as it is in heaven today. Lord, we take authority right now. We take authority right now in the name of Jesus that nothing formed against us can prosper. Lord, we pray for your presence. Jesus, we pray for your presence, your resurrected presence. We celebrated it last week, and now we need it this week like we never have before. We ask for your presence to reign, for your presence to reign in our lives, for your presence to reign in our homes, for your presence to reign in our city and our nation today. Father, touch our nation today, I pray. At the name of Jesus, we proclaim you as Lord of all, as Lord of all. songs 
in this place. Just put his name on your lips over your circumstances, over the service. Come on, just lift up the name of Jesus. He deserves it. He deserves it. No one has the power to save but you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we come before you this morning. We have gathered in your name to worship you. Father, I feel an urgency this morning to pray Pray for this place, Lord, to pray for your house today. To pray for the church of this basin. Father, we pray this morning that nothing formed against, nothing formed against us can prosper today. You're a great and mighty God. Great and mighty are you. Great and mighty are you, God. Lord, I pray right now that you reach down and, and give us a hope. Give us a hope again. Let us hope in you. Father, I bind the distractions of the enemy today. Father, I bind principalities and powers. Father, I bind drugs and alcohol addiction, and Lord, addictions that would hold us in bondage. Father, I pray today for your touch. I pray today for your blessing. Lord, I pray today for your anointing. 
Lord, we declare today that you are great and you are mighty. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Before you're seated, turn to someone next to you and say, God's good. Give them a high five and say, God's good. 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 Aren't you glad to be here this morning, church? Man, you look so good. You look so good. Hey, I just want to give a huge shout out to all of you that helped us last week. Many of you made the decision to attend second service to help with uh, Easter morning attendance. And if you wouldn't have done that, we would have had trouble. We're, we're grateful to you. Thank you so much for that. Man, God moved in such a powerful way last week. So many people giving their hearts over to Jesus. And, and that's why we're gracious hosts. That's why we're gracious uh, friends and neighbors here in the house of God. So thank you for that. Give yourselves a hand for that. That's so important. So important. As the church grows, and, and you might think, why am I giving myself a hand? As, as the body of Christ grows, sometimes people will be seated in your chair. And sometimes they'll take your parking spot. But we got to have grace, right, and be good neighbors because we want people to know of the goodness of God, and we want this place to be a place where Jesus is known. So thank you for being willing to do that. Well, this morning, I just wanted to, for our first Sunday of April, believe it or not, just to uh, give us just a quick perspective on the area of giving. Today's a, a first fruits, kind of a beginning of the month. Maybe you've just got your, your paycheck this month, and, or you've gotten your tax return or something like that, and you're like, what is God's word really? Or you didn't get a tax return. Um, <laughs> it's two camps in the room, I'm sure. But I just wanted to give us a perspective that when we all pull together to do something for Jesus, we can do more together than we could ever do individually. This is an interesting statistic. This is not true here. It's much bigger than this. But in the average church in the United States, 80% of the people do not give anything. Which means that everything that happens is being taken care of by 20%. And so as an interesting thing, and sometimes that seems like a really big number, but when I think about that, sometimes to help me, I kind of drill down to something a little bit smaller. For every 10 people that you see in the congregation, two of them give. So when you think about it like that, now that, again, that's not true here, but I just want to challenge you. If you've been looking around, maybe you're new to Refuge City Church. We don't, we haven't, in fact, the last two Sundays, we haven't received offering in a formal setting in the service. We don't talk about it often, but what I want to say to you is we do more together than we'll ever do apart. We want to see Jesus do a mighty thing. So I was reading recently in the book of Ezra, I've been reading Ezra and Nehemiah, and talking about the return of the exiles from Babylon. And so what's interesting with this story is that Little bits at a time, the captives are being brought back under the, the leadership of Ezra, under the leadership of Nehemiah. And Babylonia, in generations past, had taken a lot of the articles from the temple. So what's really cool is that the king at the time realizes that he needs to partner with God's people because Jerusalem is in disarray. And he starts sending those articles back, all the cups and the labors and all the stuff, so that they can put it back into the temple. But there's an interesting thing that happens, and, and this blows my mind, because these people were in captivity for generations, and now they're coming back to the land, and the first thing that they do is they start to give in order to make sure that the house of God is taken care of, as they're repopulating the promised land that the house of God is taken care of. Let me read just a few verses. This is in Ezra chapter 3. Remember, these are captives. These are people who had been in slavery. These are people who didn't have much. And it says, and they kept the feast of booths that is, as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and at all appointed feasts of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons, that's all the people who could do cement and rock work, they gave money to the carpenters, people who could work with wood. 
They gave food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrrhenians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So what was so powerful is they began to have an open eye to what was needed. And they began to give and to invest in the places that need to grow, that needed to be strengthened. And as they did that with their little bit, little by little, God rebuilt the temple, and he rebuilt the walls, and pretty soon Jerusalem was back in the glory that God had intended for it to be. And sometimes we think, oh, it was all of the really opulently wealthy people that did that. No, it was the captives. It was the people who were once bound, who have now become free, that are thankful to the God of heaven, that said, now I want to make sure that it's available for the next one. And they gave what they could. They gave food, they gave finances, they gave free will, and they gave the regular offerings. I just think that's a really powerful picture, because sometimes we wait. Can I just encourage you in 2024, let's not be the one that waits. Let's give unto the Lord. God doesn't need our money, but he does something in our heart when we open our heart to him. And the powerful thing is, is that God then multiplies that and helps us as a family do things. You've seen some of them. You, you, you met Amos a few weeks ago. It was powerful. You met John a few weeks ago with, with Africa. So you're seeing that what happens when we pull together as lives are transformed. So I want to say thank you for that. I want to say thank you for being faithful. And, and maybe God's speaking to your heart this morning. Maybe you've waited. And that's okay, because we live in a world where we have to watch for a little bit to be able to make sure we can trust but our heart's desire as a refuge church family is to steward well so that we can reach lives. Amen. Let's pray over the offering. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to give. I pray, God, that you would do a work as we give by faith, not under compulsion, not under guilt. That doesn't have any place here. We just want to do this together as a family. In Jesus' name. Amen. So you'll see on the screen, you can text to give, you can give on the website, you can also give on the Church Center app, or you can give in the giving boxes after service. Whatever you give today, give it unto the Lord, and the Lord will bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Give Pastor Jimmy a hand. Praise the Lord. He, uh, he and our finance team do such an amazing job, and just wanted to announce next week we're going to be having a testimony um, via video and then launching the full part of it. We're going to do a little teaser um, in service next week of someone that, that followed the principles that Pastor Jimmy just laid out and you're going to hear of some miracles that happened in their life. And I, I want to say this, um, Pastor Jimmy um, made mention to it. We don't, we're not really a congregation or a church that talks about finances all that much and there's a reason for that. Number one, you guys do give and I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're not the statistic that Pastor Jimmy gave, and I believe that is relevant in what we're seeing God do um, with all of our campuses and helping some of these smaller churches, and God's prospering them as well, um, and also being able to help Israel and Africa and the Philippines and so many different places you do, and I just want to say thank you for that from the bottom of my heart, and, um, and the Lord says that he'll bless you. How many want a blessing from God? Amen. Amen. I'd like if you would to turn to Ezekiel 37. Probably a portion of scripture that you have heard um, spoken on and um, given reference to, especially in the realm of revival. Um, this is one of the most powerful revival texts in the Old Testament that ministers and pastors used to um, challenge and to bring forth a positive word about what it is to arise and to, um, to, feel, to feel God's presence and authority come upon them. This morning, I want to go a little bit, I want to go in a little bit different direction. And this is somewhat of a serious message that I want to give to all of us today. I don't know, I don't know if I'll, I'll preach all that long today because I, I really want to spend some time with us praying together and praying for one another and for you to seek and to pray for yourself about a topic that I think um, has been a resident topic for a long time. Many of you have heard what I'm going to share about this morning. You've heard the word over and over again. You've probably in some realm um, asked for this word to be manifested in your life. And that word is hope. Everybody say hope. 
And I'm not going to I'm not going to present it in a negative fa- facet today or in a, in a negative context. But but this week alone, not only was I called out um, to go into people's businesses and to pray over their businesses because of anomalies and weird and odd things that are happening for people in our church that own businesses, but also two or three just really direct either emails or phone calls of people that are saying, Pastor, I just, when when I hear people say this, how many of you know, so I'm going to get to this in a minute, but how many of you know God created you to have life and have it more abundantly? And I know that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 that in the last days that there would be a lot of different things and that people people would cry out for him to come back. I, I don't think that is a bad thing. I think we, I, matter of fact, I think for the last 2,000 years we should have been crying for Jesus to come back. Can I hear an amen? But I've never heard a despair within people's lives. And I, I want you to hear what I'm saying because this is very serious this morning. I've never heard a despair in people's lives where they're saying, Pastor, it would probably be better off for me if I just wasn't here anymore. It'd be better for my family. It'd be better for my finances. It'd be better for everyone involved if, if my life just didn't exist anymore. And it's been an on, ongoing um, cyclical type context, but I, I really feel like that, especially for some reason, since the turn of 2024, it's been an extremely volatile principality and power that's been unleashed upon the United States and probably around the world. I haven't been around the world recently, but just hearing the despair of people, the frustration in people's lives that all of my debt, if I, if I were to, to take my last breath today, all of my debt and the weight of, my, of, of the debt of my life, whether that's finances or relationships, how many of you know that debt sometimes isn't just in money? We need to understand that, that there's debt in other areas of our life. There's loss in other areas of our life. And, and for whatever reason, and I'm not trying to, trying to conjure up some yippee ki rah-rah, cheerleading type thing today, but I, I do want us to consider the context of us as Christians that may propitiate or may manifest that same spirit of desperation in the realm of I, I, I sometimes wish I just wasn't here. That my husband would be better off if I wasn't here. My wife would be better off. My kids would be better off. I want to tell you something. That is the father of lies. Hear, hear, hear your pastor today. That is the father of lies trying to speak curses over you to keep you stuck where you've always been doing what you've always done. And it's amazing to me that the minute that people get hopeless, we have to find a way out. And how many of you know, we've, the reason why we're hopeless is because we feel like we're not in control, so we do crazy things to get in control, which usually hang on to us longer anyway. You look at people that started massive issues in their life with, with habits, things that they wish they didn't have attached to them anymore. And you go backwards. When did that habit start? When did that conflict start? When did that drug addiction start? When did that alcoholism start? It usually started at a spot in their life when they were at the very bottom and there wasn't any answer and they did whatever they could to make it through one more, one more day. They didn't, they didn't, maybe they didn't even know to turn to Jesus. If that's you today and, and you're absorbed with the habit and you're like, Pastor Jim, that was me 20 years ago and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to partner with that anymore. I didn't know Jesus then and I know Jesus now. Well, that's the greatest hope you can walk in. That's the greatest thing you can walk in. Can I hear an amen? Whom the sun sets free, they are free in. How many know the sun will set you free? Yes. Pastor Jim, I've been praying for freedom. Well, I want to share something with you. Condemnation is also a lie of Satan. He loves to breed condemnation in our lives. Look, you haven't come that that far. I bet since you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I bet you've come a lot further than you thought you've come. Matter of fact, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm doing better than I was. Turn to him and say, I'm doing better than I was. I'm doing better than I was. Everyone has had moments when they felt like all hope was lost. We can often face discouragement when our spirits and hearts feel heavy and we're fighting confusing circumstances for which 
which we have no answers. I think that's one of the most prolific and disparaging conflicts with hopelessness that we've got to, that we've got to deal with this morning. I want, I want everybody to hear this. So many people have started things in their life, not for whatever reason, not to complete them. And they actually felt like God told them to. I, w- I want to share something with you. God did tell you. How many of you know sometimes you take a step and God takes a step? Draw nigh unto me, and, or draw nigh unto him, and he will draw nigh unto you. Just because the plan didn't come out like you thought it should, doesn't mean it still wasn't God's plan for that time. You, you need to hear what I'm saying. Just because you didn't finish it, or it didn't get fulfilled with you, doesn't necessarily mean that the faith that you had to start it didn't build something and launch something in your life God's going to use later. I've, I've seen this with people, I've seen this with young people. That, that go off to college and they come home and they say college isn't from them. And then they end up, you know, doing some other job and, and, and trying to find their way. I, I just want to say to you that, that whatever God has you and wherever God has you, he has a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, and not to fail you. He'll never fail you. We can often face discouragement when our spirits and hearts feel heavy and we're fighting confusing circumstances for which we have no answers. When that happens, however, we can turn to God and lean on Him. Finding hope in His promises and unfailing love. I want want everyone to hear this sentence. Matter of fact, some of you need to write it down. Hope is the anchor to your soul. Hope is the anchor to your soul. If the enemy can twist your circumstances into giving you a hopeless ideal or concept to it, over time he will steal you of your joy, he'll steal you of your peace, he'll steal you of your patience, he'll steal you of your love, he'll steal you of your kindness. He'll steal. How many know the whole thing the enemy wants to do in this day and age is steal the fruit of the Spirit off of Christians' lives? How many realize that? Give me an Amen. How many know you've got to fight for your fruit? You've got to fight for your fruit. You've got to contend for your fruit. A feeling of hopelessness can come from disappointments, failures, and prolonged challenges. Everybody say prolonged challenges. This week in the instances, and I don't, I don't want to embarrass anybody, and I ask a few individuals if I could... They, they didn't even know I was preaching this, and I said, this, this isn't ironic. How many of you know the Holy Spirit never works with coincidence? It's always our steps are ordered by the Lord. But I didn't want them to be here this morning. Some of them are. I've already seen them. I didn't want them to be here this morning and go, I am the fodder for every time Pastor Jim preaches. <laughs> Some of you may have felt that way. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but that's honestly not it. How many of you know the Holy Spirit knows what we need, when we need it, and how we need it? All that being said, people are dealing with prolonged challenges in this world like I've never seen. Is, is our finances ever going to get any better? Am I, what, what did I do that put on a spirit of poverty on me? Why, why, can't, why, can't, I, why can't I get past this certain barrier in my life? Why, 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 why am I dealing with the finances I'm dealing with? Why, why am I dealing with this residual health issue? Why, why am I dealing with this? Why, why am I always in pain? Why, why do I keep having these headaches? Why, why, why am I fighting diabetes and I have to do dialysis? Why, 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 why just about the time that I get a, a, a fresh bill of health from the doctor on cancer, it seems like it comes back? I, I'm tired of fighting. Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying this morning and I want to have hope. I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I'm tired of believing and never seeing. How many of you know the opposite to that is this? Faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not yet. Not only is the enemy trying to steal your hope, but he's definitely trying to steal your faith. Prolonged challenges. I've seen prolonged challenges in marriages. Pastor, I've I've been with this person for, for this amount of time. That's a long time. Whatever that is in there, that's a long time. 
Pastor Jim, I was with a person for a long time and I'm not with that person anymore and I wish, I wish things had gone differently. I wish I could go back. I want to share something with you. The thing that will steal your hope more than anything is the wish you could coulda, shoulda, woulda gone back to do something you can't do now. But how many of you know that many of you are judging yourself on who you were before Christ, not who you are after Christ? How many know you've been born? If you've been born again, you need to let yourself be born again if you're going to walk by faith and not by sight, according to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's a powerful verse of Scripture. I've watched it with kids and grandkids. Two of the phone calls that I dealt with this week are, Pastor Jim, I have been fasting and praying for so many years for my children. I don't know what I did wrong. Pastor, I, I, I don't want you to fluff it for me. I don't want you to beat around the bush. I just want you to look me in the eye. I'm going to tell you some stories about my family, and then I want, I want you to scold me, and I want you to tell me what an awful parent I was and that I stunk at being a parent. See how quiet it got? Because I long for my kids. I raised them up. The Word said, Pastor Jim, I'm not saying that the Word lies, but I, I raised my kids up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, and they're the exact opposite of that. They're running like they've never ran before. They, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not even close. Pastor, I'd like to say they, that, that they were, they're not even close. Matter of fact, anything godly and anything spiritual that's mentioned, they're the first to mock it which just wrenches my heart and wrenches my spirit. Matter of fact, I don't know why I feel this. I'm not just trying to do this to do different stuff, but this morning, if you are burdened, you are burdened, it's a heavy burden, and you need some fresh hope to believe that God can answer your prayer with your children and your grandchildren, and you want to see God have a breakthrough with them, I want you to stand to your feet boldly right now. I want, don't, don't even mess around with it. Don't even think twice about it. Just stand up and say, that's me. I, I, I want God to change. I want God to change it. I want God to change it. I want God to change it. I prayed for years. I prayed for years. I prayed for years. Anybody else this morning, don't let this opportunity, don't let this opportunity fade. This may be the breakthrough. You may say, Pastor Jim, me standing isn't going to do anything for my kids. I beg to differ with for you. This morning, if you have prayed for a breakthrough, you have prayed for a breakthrough, I, and, and, and you need some fresh hope. I'm going to give you just a few more minutes, and then I'm going to stand. I, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. I want you, if you would, if, if you're not standing, I want you to just, just turn around and, and, and put your hand towards somebody. Don't put your hand on them. Just put your hand towards somebody. And all of you that have your hands raised, I, I, I want, or all of you that stood, I just want you to raise your hands towards the heaven, and I'm going to pray a simple prayer over you right now before we go any further in this message. Father, I praise you and I thank you this morning for lineage and for heritage. Lord, I thank you that your word said if we would train up our children in the ways of the Lord, if we would train our children up in the ways of the Lord, they wouldn't depart from it. And Father, I pray right now for the lie of the enemy that continues to come against us, that continues to, to flood us, that continues to frustrate us, that continues to grieve us. Father, I bind a grieving spirit right now that's tried to attach itself to us, that's tried to cause us to believe that, that, that it'll never happen. Lord, I bind a spirit of doubt right now in Jesus' name in this room. Father, I pray that you will begin to loose miraculous signs and wonders and miraculous transformation over our kids. Name them right now. Over our children right now. Over our sons and our daughters right now. I pray that you will have visitation with them and they won't have an experience. They will have an encounter with you, Jesus, that will radically change their life and bring them back. Bring them back. Bring them back. Proclaim that right now. Lord, we pray you'll bring them back. You'll bring them back right now. You'll bring them back. You'll bring them back to the calling. Lord, we know they had a call on their life. Lord, we saw the call on their life. And Father, I pray you'll redeem that call over our kids and our grandkids, our children right now. Father, we pray for your blessing to be upon us. Lord, let hope begin to arise within us again. Lord, may we not partner with confusion and doubts, with anguish and frustration over our family any longer. Father, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon this. 
Father, we pray for your glory today in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Yet even in the midst of such trials, we can choose to put our trust and hope in God. How many know He is our refuge and strength? A very present help in trouble. Woo, I love that. He is our refuge and strength, the one who sustains through every season. His mighty acts and daily provisions remind us of His faithfulness and His promises give us hope for the future today. How many know we've, we've all been ready to give up? I bet if I were to ask in this building today, how many of you at some point in your life just wanted to give up? I'd probably have a 100% response at some, po- at some point. Some of you just wanted to throw in the towel, and yet God says it's not over till I say it's over. Amen. It's not over your situation till God says it's over. Do you have hope today for your marriage? Hear, hear, hear this this morning. Do you have hope for your marriage? Do you have hope for your future? Do you have hope for your children? Do you have hope for your health? Do you have hope for America? Do you have hope for your business and your job? It's time for God's people to begin to resurrect their hope again. It's time for resurrected hope this morning. Can I hear an amen? A resurrecting. Everybody say that. Resurrecting of my hope. Resurrecting of my hope. we got to resurrect it. It's tried to die in some of us. And how many know it's time to resuscitate some hope again in our lives? I want everybody to get a pencil or a piece of paper out. You're going to want to start quoting this to yourself. Hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and can achieve the impossible. I want to give you this again. Hope sees the invisible, feels the tangible, and can achieve the impossible. How many of you really believe that this morning? Amen. Resurrecting hope is the title of this message. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. So this is the prophet Ezekiel. And he's crunched right in the middle of the prophets that Pastor Jimmy just made mention of between Esther and Isaiah and Malachi and Nehemiah. And he's in the same boat. So this is a prophet that's in the same boat. They've been in exile with Babylon, and now they've got an even more difficult problem. We're going to go over that in a minute. They've been, matter of fact, they've been in exile for over 100 years. And the Lord came to Ezekiel, and the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Spirit. He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. Everybody say bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, valley, and behold, they were very dry. So I think all of us can get a word picture in our mind. We need to get that word picture that Nehemiah is taken out by God to a valley, and in that valley it was obviously the place of a great battle, which subsequently ended in a, in a slaughter of God's people. There were, this place was the place where multitudes, thousands, probably tens of thousands of Israel soldiers were killed in the battlefield. Verse 3, and he said to me, Son of man, can, you, can, can these bones live? I love this. I, I, I don't want to... I, w- I want to get verse 3. I want to start over. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Now, I don't know about you, but if the Lord took me out in a vision or took me out literally over a valley of a bunch of dry bones, and he said, hey, Jim, can these bones live? I'm not going to be as wise and mature. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be human as your pastor. I'm I'm just going to be vulnerable. If God said, do you think these bones can live? I wish I was as spiritual enough to look at God and go, only you know, God. Isn't that a really good answer? Because I'd look at God and go, no way. Never going to happen. Don't see it. It's him possible. The problem with hope is we look at the situation through our earthly eyes instead of looking at it through heavenly eyes. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How many of you know some of you need to go home and you need to speak over some areas of your life? You need to speak over your marriage. You need to speak over your physical issue. You need to speak over the pictures of your family. And you need to say, listen to me. Thus says the Lord, oh, dry children. Oh, dry grandchildren. Listen to me right now. Can I hear an amen? Mm. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, 
Ooh, this is where it gets good. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall, you shall live. How many know? The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and his ultimate thing is he wants people to die. He's the father of? And how many of you know Jesus said, I came to give life and to give it more? abundantly. So I want to read verse five again. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall. How many know God needs a church that's alive, not a dead church, not a fighting church, not a church that's wounding each other, but a church that's standing together. And I don't mean just this. I mean the big C it's time for the enemy to quit dividing the churches of Jesus Christ. And it's time for us to stand as one. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Ooh, that was good. Man, I almost got anointed there. Verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you. This is still Ezekiel prophesying what God tells him to prophesy. He's only repeating what God tells him to say. Verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. This is very important. I want to share something with you. Not every situation in your life is a dead issue yet. It may look like something dry and bony. But if God's involved, it can still be resurrected and come back to life. My point this morning is it starts with resurrecting hope. If I don't partner with God in faith and hope, I'm going to continue to see what I've always done and deal with what I've always dealt with. This is good stuff this morning. So I prophesied and I was commanded. I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a... How <laughs> I many know we need some dry bones rattling again? <laughs> this is it right here. I love that song. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. Whew. I want to share with you this morning, and I'm not just trying to use Scripture, and not just trying to use current songs that are being ministered to you, but I believe there's something that's starting to rattle in your life. You've held on, you've been faithful, and now it's time to see the flourishing of what you've prayed for. It's time to see the faith and the evidence of what you've cried out to God for. I want want to begin to ask you this week that that you can start hearing the rattling. Matter of fact, say it right now. Lord, let me hear the rattling. Lord, let me hear the rattling. I want to hear the rattling of it, God. I want to hear the rattling of it. A rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no... I want to share something with you. It's time for the Holy Spirit to be preached again in church. We've avoided, listen to this, we have avoided preaching the Holy Spirit because we've been afraid of the tongue issues. I want to share something with you. We need to not be so afraid of the supernatural that we stop the power. The tongues aren't the issue. The power and endowment of the Holy Spirit is the issue. Can I hear an amen? We've gotten all twisted up on semantics. God's not concerned about the semantics. He's concerned about the power and authority that you're walking in. The semantics come after. Woo! Man, that was good. Amen. Preach it, sis. Mm. Where am I? Where am I? Oh, verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. How many know some of you need to start prophesying for the presence of God? How many know what he's talking about is the breath of God? I'm going to get to it in a minute. You need to start asking God to breathe on your health. God, you breathe on my sickness. God, you breathe on my back. I've had enough anointing oil that I could lube an entire trucking company on my back. Now it's time for you to breathe on it. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Woo! Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says... How many know? Sometimes we need to get a little King James. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Thus says... Thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may... Do you know what slain there means? The actual word translated is defeated and dead. They translated it slain, but it means defeated and dead. I don't know about you, but I've had some defeated and dead things in my life that I need to have resurrected with some hope. The hope has to start before the resurrection. The faith has to start before the answer. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, 
And here's the part. Matter of fact, I want everyone to read it out loud with me. And our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. A couple of months ago, I was praying for our church. I was interceding for our church for, for what God wanted to do in 2024. And I, I, I rarely do this, but I, uh, I was just thumbing through my Bible. My Bible's all marked up. Um, it's got stuff. How many of your Bibles are marked up? So it, this one doesn't, this one isn't ruined yet. Because this is a new one I've had for three years. And I'm very careful with it. How many know sometimes we're not as, and I'm not trying to be uh, self-righteous with this, but we need to be careful with the Word of God. Yes. Pastor Colton showed a, showed a clip and a video clip to our youth group this last Wednesday night. Many of you may have heard some, somebody that's going to answer before the Lord, and I don't want to be there when he does or she does, decided to bring in a, a trailer full of Bibles, over 200 Bibles in Tennessee, and light them on fire on Easter Sunday morning in a church's you, you think we're not dealing with persecution. It's not a matter of it's coming. It's already here. Not only is there persecution from the outside, but we need to stop having persecution in the inside. We need to stop talking about one another and start unifying together to each other. Mm. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up. And our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Verse 12, God instructs Ezekiel to prophesy again. He says, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God. Now, I brought this up just a few moments ago, but I I want everybody to hear this this morning. There are some things that's happening in our nation. There's some things that's happening in our country. There's some things that's happening in our state. There's some things that's happening in our city. There's some things that's happening in your home where it's time for you to arise and resurrect the hope in your life. And you really do. I'm I'm not just saying this to be cliche this morning. Hear me. Some of you need to start going around and start saying, thus says the Lord over it. You need to start. You need to start. what, What are you saying, Pastor Jim? It's time to quit speaking your doubt and your conviction, your heart. It's time to speak his word and his truth over it. If God said it, then it's true. I love this part. Therefore, prophesy and say then, thus says the Lord, behold, I will. I'm going to open up your graves. I'm going to open the things that were closed. How many of you know? So this is interesting to me that why God does this, because it's metaphorical, but it's also factual. There's two things that God's doing here. How many of you know when you put something in the grave and you bury it and you seal it, it's pretty much done? There's a lot of things that you have put in coffins There's a lot of things that you have buried in your heart and in your spirit, and it's time for some resurrection. It's time for the resurrected hope of Jesus Christ, not for disappointment. When I talked to people, and I talked to a few this week, and I said, do you believe God can do it? They were like, Pastor, I once did. I I want to share something with you. The first thing that we need to start fighting more than we've ever fought before is the I once did. We need the now I do. Give me an amen. It's not time for the once I did. It's time for the now I do like I've never done before. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I want to read this again. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will open your graves. I'll open those things that have been shut up. I'll open those things that look impossible. How many of you know you put something in the grave, it looks impossible? Do you know that's why Mary and Martha had such a problem with Jesus and taking too long to come from Jericho up to Bethany? The first thing Martha did to Jesus is he walked, she walked up to him. You can read the story. She walked up to him and she says, why is it taking you so long? It's too late now. And Jesus just, this is what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did? He didn't scold her. He didn't reprimand her. He just started to cry with her. A lot of people have said, why did Jesus weep? How many know that's the shortest verse in, in, in the Bible? Jesus wept. I've had a lot of people say, why did Jesus weep? I don't think Jesus wept because he was upset about Lazarus dying. I think he wept because Martha was still walking in doubt. That's just my own context. You, you, you can study it and do what you want. But I guarantee you the sorrow that he felt, because he already knew what he was going to do to Lazarus. He already knew what was going to happen to the grave. 
He already knew what was going to happen to the circumstance. He was going to raise that situation. But the doubt that he thought someone shouldn't have, and they did have, I think grieved his spirit. I want to share something with you. we got to stop partnering with the enemy and grieving the Holy Spirit and resurrect some hope again in this house. Mm. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, verse 13, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. Verse 14, then I will put my spirit within you. I want to, Father, I just pray this morning. I just pray this morning right now at the sound of this simple, humble preacher's heart that you'll begin to put your spirit within us again. Lord, you'll fill our lungs, you'll fill our minds, you'll fill our, our spirits Again, Lord, you'll breathe on us. Breathe on your people again, Lord. I prophesy a fresh breath from heaven upon your people today. Those that are watching, wherever they're at, whatever despair they're in, whatever they have said, that it'd be better that I should die. Lord, I bind that statement, and Lord, I bind our tongue that would come against you. Lord, we speak right now, life and life abundantly. Lord, breathe upon us again with your spirit, I pray this morning. Raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Over a hundred years before this prophetic context in Ezekiel thirty seven, the Assyrians had conquered the north kingdom of Israel. All of the north all the north part of Israel had been conquered. And the Babylonians had done the unthinkable and they destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah, including Jerusalem and the beloved temple as well. It was all destroyed at this point where Ezekiel's at. How many of you know Nehemiah went back to try to fortify it and try to build it back? But the Babylonians had destroyed it. Ten, Ten long years had passed and their survivors were living as POWs and slaves in a foreign land. I don't know about you, but I've been looking out across God's people and the disappointments that's been happening, and they look like prisoners of war. I want to share something with you. We are not prisoners of war. We are children of the Most High God. We are not prisoners of war. We are children of the Most High God. And slaves in a foreign land with no hope. And then God gives Ezekiel a vision. The scenes of valley where a great battle had taken place. The bones of God's people laid everywhere. The skeletons of past warriors that no longer have life or fight, lay bleached in the sun. Verse 2 notes that these bones were very dry. Everybody say very dry. I think that's interesting as I do a little exegesis in Scripture right now. Do you know that the very dry, in anytime something's emphasis like that, it's, it's already trying to emphasize hopelessness. How many of you know it doesn't matter how dry the situation is in your life, God can do something with it. God can bring things upon it. These folks had been dead a long time, all hope of life was gone. In verse 11, God says the bones represented Israel, who says in their captivity, O bones, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off. They never expected to see their beloved homeland again, yet God says differently. As he brings the bones back to life and fills them with his breath and his spirit, so he says he will surely restore the nation of Israel, like in the vision The restoration is two-part. Listen to this. Here's the restoration. First, the nation is brought back to life. Then it's filled with God's own breath, spirit, and power. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I realized America needs to be resurrected again with God's power, and it needs to be filled again with God's breath, spirit, and presence. Can I hear an amen? Amen. If you want to start praying for your nation in 2024, do this. The nation needs to be brought back to life, and then this nation needs to be filled with God's breath, His Spirit, and His presence again. Can I hear an amen? amen. So how, how do we do this? Whew. All right. Pastor Jim, this has all been good, but now I, now I need a little information. Well, I'm glad you asked, because I've been praying for a while. How do I get past that feeling of dejection? How do I get past the evidence? How many know sometimes the evidence is contrary to the truth? Here's the problem. We start believing the evidence before we believe the truth of what God said about it. How many know we got to reverse that? I need to start believing the truth and, and not disregard the evidence, but lay the evidence before the altar of God. So in the context of discussion 
just this week, but this, matter, this message was pretty much already done. There, there are a couple things I want to share with you this morning, and then we're going to finish this message next Sunday. And here's the first one. Here's the first thing I want to give you. Don't, don't limit, don't limit what God can do. Now, how many know when you're in church, one of the things that annoys me is when the preacher gives a point that's an obvious. I'm just going to be frank. So I, I listen to a lot of preachers. And they're getting all built up. They're giving me the introduction. They're on fire. I'm right with them. Man, I need some hope again. I need to arise and shine. It's time for me to come. Bam, he gets to port one. And this is what he says. Don't limit what God can do. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> That's all you got? You built me up to give me that? <laughs> and here lately I've been thinking, hmm. Huh. Sometimes the basic issue is the biggest issue. Sometimes the basic point is the most conflicting point. Because all of us in here, we're spiritual. Well, let me rephrase that. Most all of us are trying to be spiritual. And none of us in here, if I were to walk up to you this week, and I were to shake your hand, if I were to walk up to you, Tim, and I were to shake your hand and say, Tim, God bless you, are you limiting God in any area of your life? You would say, no, I'm not. Now, Tim... Do you believe God can do great things and you need to resurrect hope in your life? And is there some areas you may be limiting God in? Indeed. <laughs> and see how it changed? We didn't rehearse that either, but thank you, you went perfect. <laughs> and the only reason that he did that is because we know what to say. And we're saying it trying to fake ourselves out about it. Do I limit God? Never! Never do I limit God. Absolutely, positively not, Pastor Jim. I'm still hung up on the fact that this is just a basic point. But in actuality, in actuality, this is the friction. This is the friction within the church. This is the friction within the United States right now. This is the friction all around the world. Is God can't even God can't fix this mess. I heard three people and one news commentator say that in the last month. Even God can't fix this mess America's in. I, I, I beg to differ. So I, I, just, I just want to uh, reiterate to everybody here, give a little history lesson. America is not based on you. America is based in God we trust. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Do we really believe that? Here's the problem with don't limit what God can do. Verse 3 says it, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. How many know people aren't limited by the origin of their birth but by the, or by the amount of money in their bank or the color of their skin? People are limited by the size of their hope. I want, I want to say this to America and to every American in this place. Listen to this. People aren't limited by the origin of their birth or how they were born. By the amount of money in their bank or the color of their skin, people are limited by the size of their hope. You know what limits God's church? It isn't the fact of anything going on in the nation. What limits God's church is our belief in that God is limited. We need to remove the barriers. Can I hear an amen? Mm. So often we feel boxed in by our circumstances and we see no way out. We may not say it out loud. We may not say it out loud, but we think, God, this has been going on so long. Even you can't change it or do anything in this circumstance to help it. You'll, you'll never change me. You'll never change me, God. I'm always going to be a drug addict. I try to go to church. God, you'll never change me. I'll always be an alcoholic. God, I wish you would change me. I don't want to have lust. 
I don't want to have these secret moments on my phone or my iPad or my computer anymore. God, I believe that you're a great mighty God, but I, I don't know why I keep going back to the same thing I've always gone back to. I want to share something with you. It's because you stopped asking for the breath. Some of you got that. How many of you know it's time for the church to start asking for the breath of God again? For the wind of God again? For the revival of God again? Can I hear an amen? For the presence of God again? And I'm not talking about the presence of God in your church. I'm talking about the presence of God in your house. I'm talking about the presence of God in your shower. I'm talking about the presence of God in your, in your car. I'm talking about the presence of God in your backyard where all your neighbors think you lost it again. They already think it, so you might as well get the presence of God over it. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Some of you need to just keep going around your house and anointing it. And I'm telling you right now, God can change things in an instant that we can't do in a lifetime. In verse 3, God asks Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And I already said this. I don't know about you, but I, I'd probably say, I, I wish I would say, say something spiritual like, God, only you know. But I got a feeling like I'd say, looks pretty impossible. Looks pretty impossible, God. If I were to, here's the problem. If I were to look at it logically, you know what's happened across the world? We've gotten way too logical and not enough spiritual. Now, I'm not talking about being freaky and ooh i I'm talking about faith and resurrecting hope again. Can I hear an amen? My God is great. How many of you know my God can change a nation in a day? He created a nation in a day in 1947, 1948. He can change this nation in a day. Ooh, man, this is good stuff. (laughs) These bones have been dead for years and years. They're very dry. There's no way they'll ever live again, God. Yet Ezekiel, he responds with an answer that speaks of greater faith and wisdom than I've ever seen. He simply says, oh, Lord, only you know. I want to share something with you. It's time for God's people to say, God, you're still in control and only you know. Only you know when this is going to get healed. Only you know when this financial situation is going to change. But I want to share something with you. I want to share something with you. This this little side offering thing just because Pastor Jimmy inspired me. It's his fault. Don't Don't ask God to change your finances if you aren't stepping out in faith to give. I'll move on. I'll move on. But I want to use that as an example. We want God to do everything, and we don't want to do much at all. Amen. How many know if we all pull together? How many know that's not just the church? That's, that's with God. God, I'll do it. I just want to share with you. God is not Burger King. Okay? I know in America we want it our way. But how many of you know God still wants it? And that's Okay. How many know that's okay? Give the Lord a hand this morning. God, I want to do it your way. I don't want to do it my way. How many of you know for decades we've been trying to do it our way and we messed it up? Woo! All right, there's a couple of things with limiting God that I want to leave you with this morning. Here's the first one. How many know we limit God because of wrong thoughts and beliefs? Amen. If you're sitting next to your spouse, I want you to put your hand on their head. Don't mess up their hair or you will pay deeply for it. Put your hand on their head. If you're, if you're, parent, you're, you're next to somebody you're re- related to, put your hand on their head, okay? And say, I take authority. Ooh, you did good, sis. I saw I just, she almost got slain in the pew there. That was good stuff. <laughs> I love it. God's doing good stuff. Good to, okay, you got it? You got it on there? I believe good thoughts. Speak it. I believe good thoughts. I bind vain imaginations. And I resurrect hope in you right now. In Jesus' name. Woo, give the Lord a praise. How many know we limit, beca- we limit God because of wrong thoughts and beliefs? For example, listen to this. For example, a culture's belief system will either limit what they can do or will expand what they can do. 
Do you know the world in the last hundred years has expanded into so many wonderful, powerful things? And don't think that it wasn't because of the hand of God. He used the hand of people, but it's the inspiration of God. How many of you know, if it weren't for the Wright brothers, we'd still be taking a train? But it takes somebody trying and... And what? And what? You know what the problem is? We've gotten afraid to fail in this world. We have. If we can't do it all perfect, all the time, right off, I won't even try. That's why I don't like golf. My idea of golf is this. That's why I like the Frisbee. Can I hear an amen? That's why God created Frisbee golf so I can succeed. Because I can throw a disc. There's no way I can hit that little ball straight down that. I can hit it to the left. I can hit it to the right. I can even kill a seagull. But I can't hit that thing straight. I don't care what you tell me to do with my thumbs. I don't care what you tell me to do with my stance. I am going to throw a golf ball somewhere in nine holes. Why you're not looking. I don't know where that came from. How many know a culture's belief system will either limit what they can do or will expand what they can do? Proverbs 23, 7 says this, for as he thinks in his heart, so what are you thinking about yourself? I want everybody, what, are, what, are, what did you come in, this week, what did you think about yourself? That was the thing that I confronted on the four or five individuals, two that I walked into a business to pray for them, and a, and a couple of emails. I said, I want you to give me a paragraph of what you're thinking about yourself right now. The two people that emailed me, finally emailed me back and goes, Pastor, you don't want to know. And I said, yes, I do. The problem is now that you've written it down, it's grieving you. And they said, do you, this one, one sweet soul said, Pastor, do you have a camera in my house? Because you're freaking me out. That's, that was the respond to my email. And I said, yes, I do. It's called the Holy Ghost. He's right there over your shoulder. Well, why, why, am I bringing, why am I bringing this up? For as you think in your heart, what, what are you thinking? It's never going to work. My kids are never going to get saved. My grandkids are never going to change. My finances are always going to be in the tank. My marriage is always going to be terrible. The circumstance in my physical body, I just, I just got to learn to live with it. I got to learn to live with it. I got to learn to live with it. I want to share something with you. It's time to start rebuking the lies of the enemy, not walking in them and accepting them and letting our hope diminish in them. Can I hear an amen? amen. Woo, that's good stuff. How I many know what we think and focus upon the most, we eventually believe. One of these people this week, I said, where, where, where are you getting, where, where, where are you spending most of your time? Pastor Jim, you don't want to know. You're right, I don't. Where are you spending most of your time? And they told me. I want, I want, I want, I want to say this. There's some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful social media outlets out there. But if the first thing you do in the morning before you while you're going potty, before you pray, is to check your Facebook feed, you're going to walk around in lies and doubts. Ooh, it got real quiet. Everybody's like, I didn't do that this morning. I want you, I want you to hear me. Since these devices, statistically, there was a great report this week. Since these devices came out right around 99, 98 was the first big bag phones, they should have stopped right there. But since these have come out, and, and you can check it, I didn't get a chance to check it, so if I'm wrong, please somebody send it to me. Since these came out, the statistic that was shared on a news broadcast I read today, 62% of teenagers are committing suicide more now than they were before these came out of our kids. Before, before these came out, there was only 4% of people screwed up in their sexual identity. 
Now there's 38% of people that are screwed up in their sexual identity. I, I just want to say this. I don't want to create an offense to anybody. God created a man and a woman. And the two can come together as one. What we think and focus on the most, we actually begin to believe. How many know that's, that's statistics? Jensen Franklin preached a powerful message. It may have been on hope. I don't remember. Some of you can go home and watch him. He's one of my heroes. But he preached a message back right after, right after the um, pandemic. They were having, this is how Jensen Franklin um, fulfilled the rules, is he met outside so 3,000 people are on the lawn of his church because they said, if you're outside, we won't do anything to you. I was like, dang, pastor, you're smart. Anyway, so he's outside in his amphitheater or wherever he's at, and he's preaching this message. And he tells this story about hope. Maybe you've heard it. I thought it was powerful when I heard it. And it was kind of sad. Anybody ever hear a story and the first thing it does is quench your spirit? So he said a psychologist wanted to register within animals their optimism. So how many know a lot of times optimism is a secular word for hope? For their optimism. And he collected 10 rats. I don't recommend it unless you're in, you know, in, in New York and then you got them whether you want them or not. But anyway, <laughs> he, he collected 10 rats. He actually co- collected 20. He had 10 rats for the first experiment and 10 rats for the next experiment, a psychologist. And it wasn't too long ago. And, and he put 10 of them in a tank, a large feed trough tank where they couldn't get out. And he monitored, this is where it gets kind of gross. He monitored how long it would take before they drowned. And most of them, half of them died at the 10 minute mark and the rest of them were all dead at the 15 minute mark. Swimming around, not being able to get out or get any breath, they finally all deceased. He put 10 more in there. And right about the time he could see the desperation hit their hit them, he would scoop them out with his hand, and he put them out, and he dried them off, and he gave them a a little bit to eat, and he let them rest for 10 minutes, and then he would put them back in. That group of 10 lived 37 hours. I want to share something with you. The enemy's got you stuck in the tank, and you need the Holy Spirit and the Father to come scoop you out again. How many of you know you need the hand of God to come and scoop you out again? You need a hand from heaven to come and help your situation out again. Now everybody's going to get on Facebook and say, Pastor Jim called us all rats today. I did not call you that. (laughs) So do not put that out there. (laughs) What we believe is what we will say and do. How many know pretty soon what you believe starts coming out of your mouth? From within the heart, the... So I asked these people, four or five people. First of all, I said, what are you thinking on? They told me. And I said, what are you saying? What's coming out of your mouth? (laughs) This this one person, Pastor Jim, you definitely don't want to know that. What you speak. I'm not just trying to give you a psychological mumbo jumbo message today. But I want, to share, I want to share something. We've got to stop watching stuff that feeds what we say that's breeding the hopelessness and the doubt. What we believe is what we will say and do. What we say and do is what shapes our life. Here's the next one. We limit God when we think we are just average. So I, uh, I met with a person. As I said, I'm, I got permission from these individuals, so I'm not hanging them out. But I sat down with a person, and they were talking about their circumstances and their situation. And to be very honest with you, this point did come out of that discussion. I had a, I had a different point that I had written months ago. And this morning, you can ask Pastor Jimmy this morning, I said, Pastor Jimmy, have you already done the U version notes? And he says, yeah, but I can change them. And I said, I love you. And I said, I want you to change this last point that I'm going to have here today. I, w- I want you to change 
We limit God when we think we are average because this person looked at me and said, Pastor Jim, I'd love to have, I'd love to have hope. I hear what you're saying. I'd love to get rid of the doubt. I'd love to believe that something's going to change. But I'm just me. I'm, I'm, then they said it. I'm just an average every day. I just want to share something. I'm not, I'm not trying to get scream and shout and holler. And, but there is nobody that's a child of the Most High God that's just average. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. How many know we need to quit quoting it and we need to start living it? Everybody say it. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. One more time. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Now I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you're not average. You're not average. You are special and wonderfully made. Don, you're not average. You're not average. You're special and wonderfully made. You're not average. You're not average. Here's the lie that the enemy wants to get us into, that we're all a bunch of sheep and we're waiting for the wolves. I just want to let you know, I've decided I'm going to be a Christian wolf and go after some of the things of the enemy. Why, Why is God's church always on the defensive? Do you know that in the armor of God, he gave you a sword and a shield and expected you to use it? Can I hear an amen? The church is not always supposed to be defensive and just roll over. Sometimes we got to fight, be brave against all evil, never form a doubt. We got to take authority over our doubts. We need to resurrect some hope. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Say it's time to resurrect some hope. (laughs) Second Corinthians 10, 12. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. You know what's happening all across the world is we're spending too much time classifying and comparing. Because when we classify and we compare, we realize that we're worse or we're no better than anybody else. When they measure themselves, look at this. Here's the problem. We're not measuring ourselves because of the authority and the anointing of God. We're measuring ourselves because of our past and who we used to be. Woo! When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not... What, what, what does the word say about them? Quit comparing yourself. Quit comparing yourself. Quit measuring yourself. It's time for you to measure yourself based on the word, not based on Instagram. Verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits. Ooh, there it is. We're talking about how we limit God. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned us to, a sphere that also includes you. How many know, I may not be able to change everything in the United States, but I can change those around me. I may never get to meet President Biden or President Trump, but I can change the people around me. I can change the hopelessness of people around me with a fresh hope in God. Ooh, that's an amen-er. Even when we are doing okay, we compare ourselves, which lends to hold us back from greater potential. Listen to this. We say things like, I'm doing pretty good compared to where they are. Everybody say, put on the brakes. How How many of you know, the minute you start comparing yourself that you're better than somebody else, you get complacent. That leads to complacency. Listen to this. We are not called to be average. God didn't, God didn't die on the cross and fill you with his Holy Spirit so you could walk around average dealing with the same influences and the same conflicts and the same problems you always had. At some point, you got to get delivered. Can I hear an amen? At some point, you got to start walking out the freedom that you proclaimed you got when you were set free. There should be a difference between Christians and those who don't know God. This is what I wrote back to one of these individuals. I said, here's the problem. And I'm not just saying this to you. I'm going to say it on Sunday. It's time. I want want to give you this. It's time for the church and Christians to be different than the people and the things of this world. 
I want you to hear that. It's time for us to arise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord's rising upon us again. If he's really doing that, it's time to display that. It's time to walk by faith and not by, not by sight. There should be a difference between Christians and those who don't know him. How many know we're alive and they're lost? How many know we're alive today and they're lost? God made us for more than average. Look at the person next to you and say, God made you for more than average. God made you for more than average. Believers should be doing better than the average person. After all, Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil world. How many know Jesus died to deliver us from this world? Not to panic us while we're in it. Not to cause us to wish we were dead while we're still alive. Woo. Do you really want to live? Do you really want to live like everyone else with the same relational and emotional conflicts, with the same struggles and fighting? Today's the day to choose to let your life become above average and to make sure that you put your faith and hope back in Jesus like you never had before. Remember, Thank you. remember this, listen to this, we're almost done. God is the one in charge, not the world. Amen. The nature, here's, here's the most powerful part I'm going to say. The nature of a miracle is such that it breaks the rules of nature. The nature of a miracle is such that it breaks the rules of nature. Now, you guys already applauded to what happened in 1947, 1948 in one day. For years, thousands of years, that pro guess where that prophecy comes out of? Ezekiel. That God would restore his nation in... How many days? And everybody said, that's, what, what did they say about it? That's impossible. There's no way that'll ever happen, and I'll never see it. I just wanted to share with you, some of you were alive and you saw it. If God can do that in one day, God can change the United States of America in one day. God can turn us back to who we really are in one day. Can I hear an amen? Stand with me this morning. The nature of a miracle is such that it breaks the rules of nature. So don't put limits on what God can do in your life anymore. Bow your head and close your eyes today. I want to pray over you. <clears throat> and I want to pray for two things this morning. We prayed for our family, but I, I felt two things as I've been studying and preparing for this word today. And here's the first one. The first one are those of you that are in, in here today and, and you're just weary of the struggles of this life. And, and you feel like, you feel like that, that you're not even a Christian sometimes. The things that you partner with, the things that you think about, the things that you... And, and, and you fight with yourself. I, I want to pray over you today. I want to pray... I want to pray a release of the enemy off of you. I want to pray a deliverance off of you today. And I want God to so seal in your heart that you're a child of the Most High, that you no longer will allow yourself to be limited, to be limited by the natural, but you're, you're going to begin to believe for the supernatural. If you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Jim, I, I have been that way. Matter of fact, Pastor Jim, I have considered taking my life. Maybe some of you in here have tried it. I want to share with you. I want to share with you. It is time to arise and shine. It's time to take every thought captive. It's time to cast off vain imaginations. It's time to begin to ask the Lord for his freedom in our lives again. And if you're here today and you have been in desperation, I, I just wish it would all end. I just, I just wish I would end. And this morning, the Holy Spirit's convicted you. And you realize you just need to surrender some stuff. You just, you just, need, 
You just need him to pour into you like he never has before. I want you to raise your hand right now all across this room if that's you. Just raise your hand. Wow. Just leave it up. Just leave it up if that's you. This is your day. This is your day. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to do one more thing. Just leave your hands raised if you can. I don't, I don't want to get your shoulder disjointed, but just leave it up there. This is your declaration to the Lord. Lord, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to raise my hand. I need some freedom in my thoughts. I need you to take my thoughts captive. <clears throat> the second thing the Lord, the Lord spoke to me about are Christians, solid Christians. They're not average Christians. But you have been fighting one battle, one conflict, one situation, one problem, one trial after another for so long that you've just become weary and well-doing. And, and, and your soul, I said this last week, I had so much response to this one little statement I said that I'm working on a series of messages on it. I gave a testimony of a pastor that said to me, Pastor Jim, I'm not physically tired, my soul's tired. My soul's tired, and you just need to be revived, and you need to be renewed, and you need to be rejuvenated. I just want you to raise your hand and proclaim that over yourself today. I need, I need some fresh rejuvenation. I need, I need some fresh presence. I need him to breathe on me. I need him to breathe on me afresh and anew. I need a fresh wind from heaven to touch my home, to touch my family, to touch my marriage, to touch my life. Father, I thank you and I praise you this morning for each and every individual here today. Father, I pray for those that are our campuses today. I pray for those that are watching all around the world. Lord, there are people that are watching right now that have gotten up in the middle of the night to watch this service. Father, I pray, I pray that you will, you will, you will resurrect. It's resurrecting hope. We need some resurrecting hope, God. We need some resurrecting hope in our life. Lord, I bind the enemy. Lord, I bind a spirit of suicide and death right now over people. Father, I bind that. Nothing formed against them shall prosper. I proclaim it today. Father, I bind suicide right now. I bind, I bind temptations, Lord, that, that it would be better without them. Father, it would not be better. And Lord, I proclaim right now they are free of those thoughts and that scuffling within their spirit. Father, I pray right now for those that are weary in their soul. <laughs> Our souls are tired, God. Our souls are tired. Father, I pray for a fresh fire. Matter of fact, begin to speak that over you, every single one of you, whether you, you raise your hand or not. Lord, I need a fresh fire. Lord, I need a fresh fire. Begin a fresh fire within me. Renew a fresh fire within me. Renew a fresh anointing within me. Lord, give me a fresh encounter, a fresh encounter of your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us again on our live stream services. We're so grateful that you're a part of our church family. We want to encourage you to stay connected with us through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, for more information on who we are or how you can get plugged in at any of our campuses, visit our website at refugecity.church. We so appreciate the continued support that you provide through your tithes, offerings, and missions pledges. We, we cannot, cannot wait, wait to, to see, see you next time. time.